One of the most fascinating and yet disheartening ocean liner companies that has existed in this world has to be the American President Lines, which was founded under a different name in 1848. The company is still around today, although they are now more focused on container shipping rather than the transporting of paying passengers. They were essentially, broadly speaking, a Pacific Ocean version of the well-known United States Lines. Starting from the late 1930s, the company, partnered with the United States Maritime Commission, began designing various types of ocean liners to fulfill certain criteria. Oftentimes, these projects would never get off the ground, being cancelled or put aside due to various circumstances. But unlike some other cancelled ocean liners, almost all of these were viable and serious. General arrangement plans, studies, and many builders' models were put forward. Many of their concepts, and there were quite a few, came after the Second World War, and probably the most famous of these is the SS President Washington, which was essentially a more improved version of the SS United States. One of my favorite liners from this batch has to be the undeniably streamlined and beautiful vessel titled Project P5S2E1 and the PXE, but in this video we will refer to her as the SS President Jefferson. Here is her story. President Jefferson's story begins in 1936 with a piece of legislation passed by the 74th United States Congress. First put forward by Representative S. Otis Bland, its core mission was to, quote, further the development and maintenance of adequate and well-balanced American merchant marine, to promote commerce of the United States, to aid in the national defense, to repeal certain former legislation, and for other purposes. This legislation is known as the Merchant Marine Act of 1936. The biggest thing that came out of this act was the establishment of the USMC, the United States Maritime Commission. This executive agency will play a big role in the development of all of these future canceled liners of the APL. One of its primary goals was to produce 500 new ships at a rate of 50 per year. In 1938, the then Pacific Mail Steamship Company took over the dollar shipping company after the USMC found the company to be unsound. A new president was then installed, a Mr. William Gibbs McAdoo. One of the first things done was the changing of the company's name to American President Lines and updating the house flag. On the ocean liner side of the company, one of the very first commissions that was put forward by the USMC to the APL was meant to be a direct response to the Japanese NYK Line's new liners that were then under construction, the Kashiwada Maru and the Azumu Maru. This new project, dubbed Project P4P, was to be run on APL's California Oriental Route, which included the ports of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Honolulu, Yokohama, Kobe, Shanghai, and Manila. Despite the start of the Second World War in Europe, designs and studies continued to be put forward. By early 1940, the concept had been approved by the USMC. Two liners of this type were ordered, and were expected to be completed in 1943. But because of the entry of the US in World War II, all plans were put aside, and by the time the war ended, the concept was shelved. Despite this, much of the studies done on this vessel would later appear in President Jefferson. With World War II now finished, the USMC and the APL began to look at reopening the Pacific for ocean liner travel, but they had a major issue staring them in the face. Before the war, their Trans-Pacific fleet consisted of the SS President Hoover, SS President Taft, SS President Coolidge, and SS President Cleveland. All four were either lost or unable to return to passenger service by the end of the conflict. So, in mid-1945, a number of concepts began to be drawn up to replace the hull and further expand the express fleet. For their main route, the same that Project P4P was expected to fill, the company began to write down needed requirements that the vessel would be expected to do 
and in turn, figure out what kind of liners they would need to design. Three different versions were put forward. The first was made up of four 18 and a half knot ships that would operate on a 56 day cycle, which their previous ships had done. The second consisted of three 23 knot ships working on a 42 day cycle. And the third consisted of two 29 knot ships that would operate on a 28 day cycle. After much consideration and several economic studies, it was found that it would be better to go with the two vessel option over the other two proposals. With that, the project went into design mode. At this stage, the two running mates were known as Project PXE, the P standing for passenger ship, the X indicating an unknown engine arrangement, and the E referencing the design type. The first thing that needed to be considered in the design was the weather and type of seas this vessel would encounter. Thanks to the US Navy's weather reports and experience in the Pacific Theater, it could be quickly determined that the weather would, on average, be much more fair than on the Atlantic. Because of that, these Pacific liners did not need as much of a displacement as their Atlantic counterparts. Another thing that needed to be considered was the fuel and how much they should carry. The only viable stop along the route that would be capable of refueling these vessels would be in Manila or in other locations around the Philippines. But the USMC considered that area not to be dependable. As a result, these run mates would need to carry tanks that would be able to hold enough fuel for the 14,500 mile voyage at 29 knots should refueling not be an option. In order to achieve a voyage of that length at that speed in just 28 days, they needed to be efficient. It did not help that, because of all the extra fuel they would be expected to carry, the dead weight would be far higher than normal. To aid the ship in sailing, the speed to length ratio needed to be looked at. Many large ocean liners at the time usually had a ratio of around 0.9. Smaller vessels, such as those who would operate, for instance, in the English Channel, would have a ratio of up to 1.2. Take into account the expected shaft horsepower, and having a decent fuel consumption, the USMC decided that the length should exceed no more than 900 feet. Before turning to the passenger, crew, and public spaces, the USMC presented the official statistics of the PXE running mates. The statistics were extensive. Among the most important were the following. Length, 895 feet. Width, 85 feet. Displacement, 37,500 tons. Fuel oil capacity, 9,500 tons. Shaft horsepower, 100,000. Two propellers. Passenger crew capacity, 1,500. Confident in the overall design, attention was turned to the layout of the vessels. First, attention needed to be directed towards the handling of cargo. On previous APL and USMC ships, the handling of cargo loading would be done by a series of masts and cranes dropping cargo down vertical cargo holds. But because of the narrowness of the beam of this desired project, and also the expected cargo load, which was going to be smaller than normal, it was thought that side port cargo hatches would be a better alternative. This did have many side benefits as well. The elimination of all cargo handling equipment on the upper decks freed up a good amount of deck space and equally increased possible passenger accommodation. Another side effect was having a very clean look on the exterior and having vast open spaces that could be dedicated towards other activities. Equally, there was a danger that high winds generated by the ship could be more severe with such a streamlined and fast liner that had next to no obstructions on the deck. Another thing that needed attention was stability. As mentioned before, the length to width ratio was fairly small for a ship her size. As a result, stability was a very real worry. To solve this issue, significant amounts of aluminium, which was now more available than ever, would be used in the superstructure to lower the center of gravity. They also ensured that all machinery spaces would be located in the center. With regard to passenger spaces, they would employ a three-class structure as APL's pre-warships had done. Because of where the ship was expected to sail, much of the passenger accommodations, especially in first class, would be located on the outer part of the ship. Soon the final design by the USMC was ready to be presented to APL. 
Presented with the ship was the economic study of how these running mates would maximize their profitability in the Pacific market. The final proposal called for these two running mates to operate on bi-weekly sailings. They would carry a limited amount of high-grade cargo that would work in tandem with the USMC's well-known C3-class cargo vessels, as well as passengers. This type of operation would allow for both the least amount of capital investment and the largest earning capacity down the road. The following year, 1946, the proposal had further evolved into an updated second APL-specific project. It was essentially the same as the PXE project. With the set general arrangement, the project was updated to the name P5S2E1. Several changes were obviously made, mostly as a result of requesting that these running mates be capable of operating on APL's around the world voyages. As a result, they were nicknamed the Great Circle Liners. One notable difference was the increase in dimensions. The overall length went from 895 to 942, but the beam was only increased by 16 inches. Passenger capacity was also increased to 1,248. The public spaces were to be luxurious and on a colossal scale. Finally, after about a year of pursuing these running mates, APL was ready to order their great circle liners. In September 1946, APL ordered several new tenders that would aid the liners in port to be built. Orders for the two vessels would soon follow. But before they could be ordered, the economic viability of these liners quickly faded away. Severe financial restraints soon came into effect, and political tension was building once again in areas that would directly affect both the liners and APL as a company. China especially would have been a major issue with their ongoing civil war. In the end, APL never pursued President Jefferson or her sister beyond the ordering of the tenders. The empty space was eventually filled by two P-2-type true ships under construction at the end of the war. They were finished off as 15,000-ton luxury liners in 1947 and 1948. The SS President Cleveland and SS President Wilson would carry the APL flag on the same route for the next 25 years. The President Jefferson concept was certainly not the only project APL and the USMC were working on at the time, and believe it or not, it would not be the last. Unfortunately, when all was said and done, APL was never able to pursue any of these ambitious but feasible projects. It is a shame that President Jefferson was never pursued. We can only imagine that in another timeline, that she was a reality, speeding across the globe in streamlined style, fortifying the fact in everyone's mind who crossed her path, that the United States is a true, innovative ocean liner contender, not just on the Atlantic, but across the world. <laughs>